Welcome back, musical friends. Today, I would like to talk about making your mixes sound as clean and as pristine as they could possibly be in maybe not so much the most obvious way that you thought of before. This comes into play especially when you're in the mastering part of your mix. If you're gonna be the one mastering somebody's track or your own, this may be of help to you. Let's take a look. Today's audio is gonna be from a mixing class that I did, and what we're gonna be looking for to make sure this mix is as clean as we can possibly get it is we're going to be looking for something called an intersample peak. And if you don't know what that is, I would strongly recommend checking out Ian Shepard's video. I'll link in the description below. But he talks about how to master your song for iTunes, and it is a wonderful in-depth video about how to exactly get that as best as you can. We're going to talk about more of that here. As you can see on my master bus, I have a limiter. It's not doing anything. The gain's at zero. If you remember from the last video, it's just to protect our speakers in case any kind of clipping happens. I'm going to play you guys the raw audio first. The limiter's not doing anything. It's just there for protection. We're not even going to be close to digital zero. Look at the master bus, barely peaking at 6 dB, negative 6 dB. Incredibly catchy song. We're going to raise the gain here an unhealthy amount. I mean, this is over-exaggerated. I, I wouldn't exactly do this at all. You're going to hear the kick drum starting to fart out. This is way too over-limited, as we would say squashed beyond tolerance. <laughs> I'm going to play the same audio again. It's going to get louder. But it gets a little harder to go there anymore And to care when I pretend that I'm aware I'm driving to the Rockies I don't see any red lights telling me things are clipping, Nick. What are you talking about? This may be a problem if you don't have a limiter that is detecting for these intersample peaks. What is an intersample peak exactly? Well, let's pretend my hand here is digital zero, and my two fingers are two samples that are going to be hitting up against this digital zero. Let's say they're butted up right on that digital zero, much like you just saw in the audio right there. Remember, though, that we are in a digital domain right here when we're mixing. To get things back to analog, there's a conversion that takes place. And when those two samples are converted back to analog, the resulting waveform is actually going to be drawn. It's going to find an average between the two and actually go over digital zero, and it's going to clip. It's going to go over in between the samples, i.e. intersample peak. They cause distortion. They cause sometimes harshness. Things won't be as clear. Sometimes it can even hurt your ears, to be honest. And you're not going to be sure why, because you're not going to see anything going on. You know, it's, it's limited. It's limited too much, but nothing is going over zero. So where's that distortion coming from? It's coming from this situation we call intersample peaks. So how do we find if these are going on. If you don't have L2, you can download this little mastering suite that Apple makes for things mastered for iTunes. There will be a plugin that will detect for these intersample peaks as if it were converting it back to analog when you did the bounce, when you uploaded it to iTunes, so on and so forth. If I turn it on in L2 right here, watch what happens. But it gets a little harder to go there. We're in the red by 0.2 decibels. Definitely going to be the cause of some distortion. What do we do in this situation? If you have a limiter that has true peak limiting, then you will avoid this problem altogether. Let's take a look. But it gets a little harder to go there anymore And to care when I pretend that Now L2 does a nice job. It makes these zeros green to show you that that's on. You know, color coordination is always wonderful. And it also is reading a solid zero. We've combated the issue. But Nick, my limiter doesn't have true peak on it. That's OK. Let's turn it back off. Let's keep on the true peak detection so we can see if those occur. And every single limiter that I know of is going to have an output ceiling trim on it. That 
is what is going to really protect you from these distortions, these intersample peaks. A lot of people use, I've seen 0.2 dB all the way to a solid decibel of just trimming, taking zero and just making zero now negative one, just to give yourself some headroom so in case peaks occur, the ceiling is still low enough so that it's not gonna hit zero. So for the example, we saw we were peaking at 0.2, right? So let's, let's make our output ceiling negative 0.2 dB. And let's see if we've eliminated the intersample peaks. We still have the detector on. Let's take a listen. But it gets a little harder to go there anymore. And to care when I pretend that I'm aware. Now again, that kick drum, everything is over limited right now. It's hitting way too hard. But we've eliminated the intersample peaks. So if you're pushing your limiter gain correctly so things still sound natural and turning down that output ceiling, you're going to avoid all those intersample peaks altogether. And that's our goal. Dynamic range is something that's so important in music. And I'm happy to say is that dynamic range is really our friends again. With streaming sites like Spotify, Apple Music, things like that, these services are actually turning things either up or down so that they will be about negative 14 LUFS. Why are they doing that? Because they realize that it's annoying for the consumer that has a large music palette to be turning the volume up or down when they have, you know, let's say a classical song for one song and then the following one is a modern dance track. You know, those two things are limited so vastly differently. Of course, the dance track would be so much louder. But what they're doing is they're making things all negative 14 LUFS so that the things are even. It's a broadcast standard that's going to be more and more important as the years go on. It's really cool in my opinion. Now what is an LUFS? Well that stands for loudness units full scale and as you can see on L2 we're at negative 14 for streaming like I said for like Spotify and things like that. If you were doing a master for iTunes or for CD I'd probably recommend putting your mark at negative 9 because iTunes doesn't normalize the volume, at least in the making of this video. They distribute things as it's given to them. So you can make it commercially as loud as you want, but make sure that you're protecting yourself against those intersample peaks. So using a negative 9 LUFS to mark that loudness would probably be more effective for the iTunes store. But for Spotify, give them something that they're already going to turn it down or up to. So shoot for that negative 14 LUFS. It's a little different than RMS. It's a long and complicated math algorithm but basically it's the loudness for the entire program or the entire track it accounts for the entire length of the track RMS only takes into account a very small amount of time per any given time LUFS literally gives the entire from start to finish the track how loud everything was and that's the number that they will use to determine how they change your volume Dynamic range is super important in music, and if you've gone to a concert before and they've done a live fade out, you will know that it's probably one of the most epic things to see because it's just it's so moving, right? To hear everything just coming down evenly like that. And sometimes they pretend like they're doing a live fade out and all of a sudden they hit you with something really loud and it's so startling. Well, recreating that on a record is very difficult because we have a finite space that we can work with or at least finite as far as what's commercially acceptable right now. Classical music, for instance, I mean, you will hear the quietest things all the way from pianississimo, like, and all the way up to fortississimo, like, incredible dynamic range there. But in pop music and in rock music, we're limited, at least nowadays. There's a reason why in Stairway to Heaven, that guitar part that comes in in the beginning and then those soft flutes and everything is so quiet when it starts and at the end of the song we're full blazing and rocking out and I always wondered why when I was listening on my iPod back in like 2007 why was that so quiet next to my other songs they didn't have the loud mastering practices that we do today so with Spotify and Apple Music leveling the playing field as far as volume is concerned we really now as artists can take advantage of using dynamic range to express our music even greater 
And that's a really important thing for a mastering engineer to know, because if this song is mainly meant for Spotify, then we know that we have more dynamic range to work with. We don't have to limit it so much that we're squashing it and the dynamic range is so little that that expression is lost and maybe the entire reason, the entire purpose of that track could be lost in the translation and the master. So it's important to know where that audio is going to be going to, where it's going to be distributed, what the artist intends for that, do they want something very dynamic, do they want something really crushed, and work within those confines. Guys, I hope this was super helpful to you. If you have any questions, of course, leave a comment below. Don't forget to also like and subscribe. I hope this was helpful. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you again soon.